some variation of this point in one way or, or another. And the people who usually say this Christians are hypocrites, um, it's sort of a, a mixed bag because you have the skeptic, you can have someone who has gone to church and then fell away or rather stopped going to church because um, maybe they've been hurt by someone or maybe they've had past experiences where uh, a Christian hurt them. And for that reason, uh, this objection comes out so clearly that Christians do not always um, align with the very things that they proclaim to believe. Um, and, yeah, like I said, it's, it's, it's always a mixed bag of, of people that would say Christians are hypocrites. There are people who would um, rather say that Christians are hypocrites because maybe they do not fully understand what Christianity is all about. And I hope during this, this sermon I'll be able to discuss or rather touch on different points um, on this topic of hypocrisy. To start us off, I, I will just throw up the definition of, hypo of what a hypocrite is. Uh, and this is simple from the internet. Uh, a hypocrite is a person whose actions contradict their stated beliefs or feelings. Now, for this, I took to the internet to come and s to basically see what people think about Christians. Now, Christians, uh, I mean, sorry, the, the viewpoints that I saw on the internet uh, weren't just from Christians, but from non-Christians as well. In fact, the majority were from non-Christians. And some of those comments were painful to read. Uh, some of them were sobering to read as well. Um, and, and I think it's necessary that we understand what the objections people actually have towards Christianity when we, with regards to hypocrisy. Uh, and I have a slide up there, because when you go on the internet, you find memes. Um, and there are a few memes there on, on what, what basically I feel are the main themes around um, what people argue as Christians being hypocrites. And there, you, on the last one, there's a, it was quite an interesting article. It says, why are millennials running from, from religion? And it says, blame hypocrisy. Now, millennials, I think we know are the, I think the people who came after the boomers. Um, so people who are from, okay. Sorry, I think battery on this one has died, so, yes. Uh, so I was saying, um, oh, nice. Um, I was saying, <laughs> um, millennials are, are part of the reason why they reject Christianity is because uh, they feel that there's a lot of hypocrisy that comes with Christianity. And in that article, there was a research done in 2015 that's found that 35% of millennials identify their religion as none. That's twice the percentage of boomers. If Christian hypocrisy isn't addressed, the, the writer says, organized religion won't last. So this is the perception that we deal with when we're dealing with people in the world. They believe that um, because of the condition, rather, of Christians um, and the hypocrisy that exists within the body or outside the body or um, um, they believe that religion won't last because people are waking up to the fact that, hey, um, why should I follow a God if you do not reflect the character of this God? And for the purposes of this sermon, I would just like to break up this message into two points. Um, and I, I think that these are two polarized points and in polarizing them, I feel um, I'll be able to highlight the, the differences between uh, the two camps, but uh, one thing we have to be mindful of is that there's a whole spectrum of this word hypocrisy and what it may look like and how it may, may manifest in the lives of different people. So there's hypocrisy by Christians who aren't actually Christians, and the second point is hypocrisy by Christians who are Christians. And I think by contrasting these two, we'll be able to see how they relate to the Christian faith. So for my first point, uh, I'm going to address hypocrisy by Christians who aren't actually Christians. Now, before I address this point, I think one of the things I need to 
highlight is how serious hypocrisy has been regarded in the Bible. Hypocrisy is not something that Jesus or God um, takes lightly. And if you go through the theme of Scripture, you'll see in countless times in the Old Testament and the New Testament, God is usually harsh towards hypocrites. And um, it's a serious sin that Jesus, even himself in his ministry, rebuked consistently as he was um, teaching. Whenever he'd go into a crowd, the harshest comments he would have would usually be, unfortunately, or for the religious leaders who him, he, himself called hypocrites countless times. For our first scripture, I'd just like to read Amos 5, verse 21 to 24. And I think this just adequately captures the heart of God and how he feels when he sees this happening in his church. Amos 5, verse 21 to 24 says, I hate all your show and pretense, the hypocrisy of your religious festivals and solemn assemblies. I will not accept your burnt offerings and grain offerings. I won't even notice all your choice peace offerings. Away with your noisy hymns of praise. I will not listen to the music of your harps. Verse 24 says, Instead, I want to see a mighty flood of justice and an endless river of righteous living. Now, this was God talking through the prophet Amos at a time where um, Israel, his people, would still carry on the religious festivals which have been passed down by generations. They would still um, observe them. They would still sing praises to God. However, God spoke through the prophet here saying, away with all of that. What I'm looking for is, is on a much deeper level. What I'm looking for is on the heart level. And Jesus himself constantly rebuked the hypocrisy he saw, um, and a large portion of this was directed at religious leaders of the day, which would, be, would, which would have been the Pharisees and the Sadducees and, and those who sat in the synagogue. In Matthew 23, which I think is um, uh, the chapter where I think Jesus just lays it out onto the Pharisees, he says, "'Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites!' He says it about six times in that chapter. And when he's not calling them hypocrites, he's calling them snakes. When he's not calling them snakes, he's calling them blind fools. And this is just something that he speaks to very strongly um, in, as he goes through um, his, his, his teaching. And in Matthew 23 verse, I mean, sorry, in Mark 7 verse 6 and 7, Jesus says, um, he replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far away from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely hum human rules. Now, one thing I want to highlight is here I'm, I'm talking about basically the person who would want to appear as holy and, and, um, and um, righteous before man and is more interested in the way that they are perceived by man and not actually interested in doing the necessary hard work that Jesus requires for you to make a change. Now here Jesus is at, at, at speaking to the Pharisees of that day because in that example you see people, I mean sorry, you had the Pharisees who would pray long prayers and who do, would um, um, be seen as the relig I mean sorry, as the holy people of that day, but they never really reached out and helped um, where it really counted. And Jesus was just highlighting that, and he highlights it in such a harsh way. Now, if you were to give an example of someone like that in this day and age, it will probably be someone who, um, and again, this is an example, there could be many more, um, someone who would proclaim that they are a Christian, um, maybe come to church on Sunday or sing lo lovely hymns or always blast gospel radio music in the car. Um, however, when you talk to the people closest to them, when you talk to the people who live with them or the people around them, they have this sort of um, constant uh, opinion or rather constant comment that their life does not match up to actually the faith that they proclaim. And this is something that is consistent that they, they view. And in such cases, um, it would be like, um, for the example, I'd, I'd use like a fake doctor. If you go and see a doctor who's not a doctor, and he treats you, and he makes you, he gives you medicine, the wrong medicine, um, 
or he gives you advice, the wrong advice, uh, you can lose faith in the practice of medicine. You say, I don't believe all doctors. Well, that person himself um, was actually not a real doctor. Um, so here I have a quote from Gandhi which says, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. And here I just want to highlight something in particular, which is, is the fruit of your actions. Uh, in M Matthew 7, verse 16 to 20, it says, you will know them by their fruits. Now here he was mentioning, he was referring to the false prophets and teachers. However, I feel like this has an application as well in Christian life today. It says, you will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. And here, this is someone whose life, harvest after harvest after harvest, is bad fruit. Though they might say one thing with their mouth, they act a specific way, or rather they consistently act another way um, when no one's looking or when they're outside um, of maybe the church environment. And it's unfortunately such sustained hypocritical behavior that has warped the perception of Christianity as a whole. So when some of the, 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 the objections that we get to Christianity with regards to hypocrisy refer to people who are in, within this group with respect to people who are in this group. And Jesus argues instead that such people who practice this kind of hypocrisy aren't actually Christians, and he won't associate with them. And the reason why I think I mentioned earlier on is because they're more focused on the outward appearance than the inward condition of their hearts. They're more interested in the respect and recognition that they may come from living a moral life or the benefits may, that may come in some societies from doing so but they aren't um, exhibiting uh, the effort or rather the saving, I mean, they're not capitalizing on the saving grace which has been made available in the Christian faith, however, still proclaiming it as their own. In Matthew 23, verse 25 to 28, uh, God says, I mean, Jesus says, Woe to you, teachers of the law, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then, outside, and then the outside will be clean. Now, here Jesus is referring to the Pharisees, and the interesting thing is in Matthew 23, in the beginning of that chapter, Jesus actually says something interesting. He says, do everything they say, but not what they do. So Jesus acknowledges that with their mouths, they are speaking perfect doctrine, or they're speaking a doctrine which is worth following. Jesus says, when they talk, listen to them, do what they say, but don't act the way that they do. Now, this, I think, is something which should um, highlight the fact that you can have perfect doctrine. You can have people who would teach the Word of God in a way that is... Um, uh, worth following, however their hearts be far away from God. Um, it's such hypocritical behavior um, that can even find its way into church leadership. It can even find its way into church um, denominations and different people who, I mean, sorry, different groups where people are following leaders. However, in this case, uh, they may say what is good. They may say what people may follow. I mean, sorry, they may say doctrine which people can um, actually listen and benefit from. However, here Jesus said, uh, don't follow the example. Now, here I know I'm just highlighting the, this special case where you have this kind of consistent hypocrisy in the hearts of man. And um, in Matthew 7, 22, it says, Jesus says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Now here we have people who exhibited the characteristics of being in Christian life and serving. However, Jesus says, I never knew you, and 
that can be interpreted as I was, you were never actually belonging to me. You were never actually a Christian. Now, unfortunately, the, the perception from the outside looking in at such people is that they are Christian, and they may be, um, sorry, um, declared as a hypocrite. However, it's not the behavior, and I just want to highlight, it's not behavior that saves, but it's faith in Jesus Christ. One can be perfect, and, and, and this is on the other side, one can be perfectly behaved, yet still be unaccepted by God. And I think it's important for us to realize that even though um, there will be people who will, God on the final day will say, get away from me, I never knew you, um, we have to still say that the Christian faith is not based upon such people. The Christian faith can be defined by what the truth says, and the truth says is that you are saved by grace, and as a result of being saved by grace, Jesus then comes into your heart. He transforms you, and progressively, your character changes from um, something that used to bear bad fruit into something that does bear good fruit. It's unfortunate that we do live in a society where we have a mixed bag, and people will still call Christianity or other Christians hypocrites based on the few examples that they've experienced in their life. P.J. Smythe in his book, uh, where he spoke on uh, some of these tough questions, he said, we need to realize how behavior might indicate whether or not you're a true believer. And the highlight there is on might indicate. It's not definite, but it might indicate whether you're a true believer. Reflecting on Ephesians 2, verse 8 to 10, Martin Luther said, we are saved by faith alone, but not by faith that remains alone. Although good behavior does, does not have anything to do with us getting saved or staying saved, good behavior should increasingly accompany the faith by which we are saved. And if it doesn't, it could indicate something very serious, that you might not actually be a Christian at all. Now, those are tough words to read, but I feel that it's necessary to highlight the one end of the spectrum to know that, yes, there are people who are genuinely hypocrites who may even proclaim the Christian faith, but may, in actual fact, have their hearts far away from God. Now, as I move into the next point, um, this is closer to home, and it's hypocrisy by Christians who are actually Christians. Now... Here, when you have a Christian brother who, uh, or sister who's acting in a hypocritical way, there are many reasons why that could be happening. And I just want to highlight one of them. I'm, I'm going to discuss two points here. I'm going to discuss genuine hypocrisy in Christian faith as well as perceived hypocrisy. Perceived hypocrisy, I, I call it that because as Christians, there's always that struggle that we go through where we would, um, for example, uh, on work on a, on, a, on, a, on a regular day, someone may come into my office and I get, I respond to them in a way that is not pleasant. Uh, I respond to them in a way that uh, is actually, un it's, it's, it's wrong. And when that happens, it's like, okay, if someone is looking at me right now, and maybe they know that I say that I'm a Christian, they might perceive that, oh, this guy is a hypocrite. But this is just for me to say that we actually do, as Christians, fail. We're not perfect. We live a life where we'll continually fall down. We live a life where we'll continually make mistakes. We will act and interact with other people in a way that may be perceived as hypocritical, that may be perceived as, as this person actually is not who they claim to be. However, in such circumstances, it is important for us to remember that we are Christians and we are being sanctified. I wish I could say here that one day we'll have a church where they are absolutely, there's no hypocritical behavior. However, as we walk the sanctification journey, we will actually come to realize that there will be times in our lives where we will act hypocritically. In fact, and I've seen this in my personal life where maybe something I would not regard as sin long ago uh, I start to see it, uh, or it starts to get revealed in my heart as sin right now. Maybe I um, did not believe that, uh, for example, laziness is a sin. Um, 
and maybe I may have been lazy in the way that I do my work or lazy in the way that I study or lazy in the way that I work. Um, but as I walk the Christian faith with God, he begins to reveal to my heart that, hey, actually, um, that is a sin. And you're not aligning to the example that Christ laid out in the Bible. You're living in a way that is contrary to that. Now, in that and in me living and walking this life, there may be someone else who is not a believer who perceives me in the way that I walk and say, hey, actually, my behavior is kind of better than that guy. And that guy says he's a Christian. Um, is he not being a hypocrite? Now, unfortunately, that's a reality that we have to li live with. But it, we also have to be recognized the truth is, I mean, the truth of the Christian faith. And the truth of the Christian faith is the grace that God has given us empowers us to live a Christian life, but it's still a process that we have to, we have to walk through. Sorry. Uh, yeah. And I'm going to highlight Romans 7, right? Because Paul here, I feel he does something which I feel is very uh, necessary for us to do, but it's also something which is, I'd say, encouraging because Paul is the Apostle Paul, the one who wrote two thirds of the New Testament. But in Romans 7, he highlights a struggle that goes on within. And in Romans 7, verse 15 to 19, it says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate to do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer myself who, d who do it, but it, who does it. But it's the sin living in me. For I know that God... I, mean, I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do, I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, I think that by definition, or rather, uh, yeah, by definition, is, is his taking an inward look in his heart and saying, my own behavior it's not someone else pointing at him. It's not someone else saying, hey, you're doing wrong. No, he's looking at the internal condition of his heart, and he's saying that, hey, there's something in me that doesn't line up. Um, the evil that I, I don't want to do, that I keep on doing, and the thing that I want to do, I, 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 I don't do. And I think it's just that inward struggle that, that reveals to us that we constantly need God's saving grace. We constantly need to bring our hearts to the cross and say, Lord, help me with myself. Help me with the fact that sometimes or I, I see behavior in me, I see heart attitudes in me that do not align with the way that I desire to live, that do not align with the character of Christ. And I recognize that and I need your help to, do, to, to walk in a way that, that is um, uh, appealing and, 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 and uh, great for you. In Romans and, and, and here Paul calls out for uh, a savior. He doesn't call out for behavior change. What here he says in Romans 7 verse 24, and here I, I put two versions, the ESV and the ISV. It says, what a wretched man I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Romans 7 24, what a wretched man in, in the ISV version. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is infected by death? Now, um, Paul goes on in Romans, to, Romans 8 to say that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But this part reveals the struggle that happens in Christian hearts where our behavior does not, will not always align with the way that, we, that way that Christ acts, with the way that Christ lived, and the way that we ourselves desire to live. But there is grace, for, and God makes grace available for us to walk this walk with him and say, Lord, actually, I need a savior. This is a condition that I cannot save myself from. This is something that I constantly need you to reach down into my heart and say, hey, okay, I'm going to heal that. If we have a repentant behavior, if we have a behavior that says, Lord, in this area, I surrender to you, please help me. God, in his grace and in his strength, comes down and, and reaches into that part of our being and says, Okay, son, let me help you. 
Um, and here, I just I, I see it as um, something that we should all constantly do as Christians is, is introspect, introspect and, and see how it is we may have hypocritical behavior where our behavior does not align with the way that we act. Um, there have been times where uh, I've had to, or rather, I have felt the need to portray a different picture from what it is I'm actually living. Um, and this was maybe when I used to be with my friends who maybe were not saved. Uh, because they were not saved, I would not want to discuss anything Christian-like with them. So when they were sinning and when they were doing what they were doing, um, I will join them in and, and say, yeah, I'm okay, I'm part of the crew. But there always used to be this check in my spirit that says, okay, right now you're acting in a way that's different from what you're feeling inside. You're not being true to yourself. And this can happen the other way, where we may act on the outside in a way that's pleasant, in a way that's kind, in a way that's um, great, and in that, in your heart, you have bitterness towards a person, or you feel a certain way about a person. And I, I, have, I have a personal life experience where I've actually, <coughs> sorry, I've been with um, people who I thought maybe were kind and gracious, um, and they were Christians. I cannot deny the fact that their life did display fruit of Christianity. Their lives displayed like, oh, these are people that I could actually look up to and, 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 and learn from. Um, however, on one day, I unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, um, overheard a discussion they were having and they were discussing me. But the way in which they were discussing me was so different. It was, it was in a, such a negative light that I got shocked. I was like, is this how they actually perceive me? Now, would I say that they are not Christian? No, in that, I, I've, I've known that their lives, I've seen their walk. But in that moment, I, I saw something of their heart. I saw, and God, and I think this is probably why God does not hate hypocrisy, because hypocrisy hurts people. Hypocrisy is something which has the ability to scar someone, has the ability even to have someone turn away from their faith. Because um, in that instance, I could have said, oh, Christians are phony. But in that instance, even though I did feel pain and hurt and all of those things, um, and the relationship still can't be at the way that it was, I think it revealed this aspect of we may still be Christians, we may still walk, but we have to be honest before ourselves and before God. When we see hot attitudes like bitterness and anger and things which are less subtle, the more subtle ones are sort of easier to pick out, but stuff like bitterness, which sort of festers and remains in your heart to the point where even what comes out of your heart at some point may even shock you. Um, and in such, a, such circumstances, it makes me look at myself and say, okay, where is it that I have such things in my heart, such things which are an offense towards God, and how can I bring them to his throne room um, in repentance and asking for grace and strength? And one thing is that it's not that we have to walk perfectly, but we have to walk honestly before ourselves. We have to walk honestly within our community. Where we are struggling, we have to say, hey, I am struggling in this area of my life. I'm struggling with bitterness, for example. I'm struggling with anger. I am struggling with lust. I'm struggling with um, uh, whatever, the, 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 the list is endless. However, we have to be honest and walk honestly before God which means in the secret place, in the quiet place where we interact with God, um, we have to be honest. And also in front of our brethren, we have to be honest. Um, there's a scripture that says in James, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of, righteous, of a righteous person is powerful and effective. In us walking in a way that is authentic and honest, um, even though we have hypocritical behavior or we may have um, areas where our behavior does not align with um, our heart belief, even when we talk to one another, people you can con confide in within the body, there's healing that takes place. There's a heart change that takes place. I remember a few years ago, I, <coughs> I attended a, a God's tribe men's meeting um, in someone's house. Now, something happened in that meeting which I had never seen before in a church 
setting. Um, men started sharing about their weaknesses. Men started sharing about where it is that they're struggling. And I said, this is strange. Um, these guys are confidently talking about their struggles. They're constantly talking about, not constantly, openly. Openly talking about their struggles and sins. And it's okay. This is a church environment. There's a pastor sitting there. There's a leader sitting there. And, and this is happening without any... Uh, embarrassment, and that has given me the confidence, and even gave me the confidence in that meeting to say, hey, actually, there's this area in my, heart, in my life where I am struggling. There's this area in my life where um, I actually need God's saving grace. And it's in those moments where healing comes, where God says, okay, I'm going to touch that area of your heart, where if someone perceives you, they may say you're a hypocrite, but I see that you have brought that to me, and in bringing it to me, I can then breathe life into that area. You can heal in that area. And there's something about being authentic, being authentic as a Christian, being authentic in the way that we walk, that um, sort of is the catalyst for our heart change and transformation um, in, as, we, as we are continually sanctified. Now, that is um, part of the hypocrisy that we may experience as a Christian, but sometimes, and, and I think I... I want to highlight that we do have a faith that sometimes fails, meaning we can, in fact, get into hypocrisy to a point where we ourselves are blind to it. We ourselves cannot see how it is we are acting hypo hypocritically. Um, and there's a beautiful example in Galatians of how this happened, and this was between Peter and Paul. And Peter, I'm sorry, Paul confronted Peter in the way that he was behaving. And this is in Galatians 2. <coughs> Galatians 2, verse 11 to 13. When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. Now here, this is Paul, who's an apostle, talking to Peter, who's the mighty apostle. If you read the Acts, the book of Acts, and he was the one who planted the church. 3,000 people got saved. We wouldn't doubt that he's a Christian. But in this, in this instance, the circumstance revealed something in his heart that was hypocritical. And it's not Peter who brought this out. It was Paul who went to him and said, hey, Paul, I'm sorry, hey, Peter, the way that you're acting is not right. Because you are in a position of leadership, the way that you're acting is, in fact, leading other people astray to join you in the hypocrisy that you're, you're portraying. And this would have been... Imagine you are a Gentile and, and, and you saw this happening, meaning you, were, you saw Peter eating with you, but when his friends came, all of a sudden he ostracizes himself or separates himself from you. What will that make you feel about this Christian Christianity that God, I mean, that they have brought to you? Because this is still in the first century and church is still growing. It's still very new. Now imagine as a Gentile seeing Peter change all of a sudden and act in a different way that may make you feel a certain way about hypocrisy or rather Christianity as a whole, and it may make you declare that Christians are in fact hypocrites. However, in this situation, thank God that Paul, another brother from the outside looking and said, I'm actually going to call out this genuine hypocrisy that I see in this brother. Even though Peter may have was senior to him, <coughs> may have been an apostle longer than Peter and then Paul was, he still said, I'm going to address him because he is a brother, he's in a Christian faith, and I'm going to call out this genuine hypocrisy that I see in him. I'm going to call it out and say, Peter, what you're doing is wrong. And I believe that in that, Peter also himself found healing because now he was almost shaken into his senses. And we need to be that to one another. We need to constantly, and, and now I'm not giving people, I'm telling people to go and tell people off all, all willy-nilly. No, that's not what I'm saying. But I am saying, if you have a brother that you see is actually acting out, and you know his life, you know that they are a believer, you know that they are a Christian, but you see them walking astray, 
I feel like it, it's biblical for you to go and talk to the brother and say, hey, actually, what you're doing is wrong. And from that, hopefully healing will come. And hopefully the person will realize what I'm doing is wrong and bring that to God and say, God, I need help in this area. Because you see, we may think that we have it perfect all the time and we may be blind to our mistakes or, or rather our kind of behavior. However, we have to recognize that we constantly need a savior. We constantly need a savior to save us from our behavior. We constantly need a savior to save us from the life that we live. Because, yeah. Because how we behave and the way that we behave in the eyes of others really impacts the way that people perceive Christianity. Now, and we do live in a society where Christianity will still get insulted. If you go onto the internet and go on YouTube and just write Christian hypocrites, you'll see the list of videos and the strong opinions people have and the themes around politics, the themes around um, uh, sexuality, the themes around um, abortion and all of that have really made people inflamed with anger against Christianity as a faith. Inflamed to the point where they say this thing is a sham because the way that these people act and the way that they perceive the Christian walk to be uh, are, do not match up. But it's important to realize that we are in fact saved by grace. It's not behavior that saves us. It is, the way, it is Jesus who died on the cross, shed his blood for us, um, that allows us to have a relationship with God. We are saved by faith and not by grace. It's similar to how in the story of the prodigal son, there are two sons. There's the son who went out and lived a life in a wayward way, and he came back to the father in honesty saying, even if you let me be a servant in your house, I'll take that. And then there was the older son who stood with his father all along, who was doing the right thing and behaving in the right way. However, the father exhibited grace to his son who went out and came back. And the son who was in the house, the older son, who was offended by his father's kindness towards his son, I mean his younger brother, um, was not, did not receive the same uh, level of, 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 of acceptance from the father because he himself closed out his heart in the way that he behaved. And I believe that we constantly need to cry out to God to help us and to assist us in the way that we interact with one another and inter in, uh, interact with him. Um, lastly, our good deeds shine before men, and, and this is a quote again from P.J. Smythe, our good deeds shine before men that they might pursue God for themselves. Christ calls us to conduct ourselves in a manner that is worthy of, of his gospel. So again, one thing that we need to remember is that our behavior does not save us, but our behavior does play an important role in how we reach out to people who do not know Christ. Our behavior does play an important role in how people outside the camp can indeed come to know Christ. If we do act out in a way that God is, is, is admirable of God, then we can actually see people being added to the body of Christ through our, good be, uh, through our behavior and through the way that we authentically walk our Christian life. We do not manufacture good behavior, but we always take that inward gaze, that inward gaze that Paul took earlier on, where he said, who can deliver me from this body? I see two things operating in my heart. The one who can save us from that is Jesus. We cannot manufacture that good behavior, but we can pursue it in our relationship with God. As we sit with Christ, as we sit with our brothers in our, in our church community, and as we fellowship with, with, with both God and ourselves, we can lay out our heart and say, God, help me in the areas that I need help in. Help me in the areas that I'm drowning. I need a savior, not just when I first got saved. I need a savior every single day because in this life, um, we will get called hypocrites. In this life, we will be part of church congregations where hypocritical behavior will be present. However, our response to that is what is important, and our response should be one where we constantly go back to God and say, Lord, I need your grace to walk this Christian out this Christian life out authentically. 
And I believe it's as we, see, we here sitting here live out our lives authentically, the way someone would say, that brother, even though he acts off sometimes, he's very honest about the way he lives his life. I can learn something from him. I can be intrigued by the fact that, okay, there is someone there who um, maybe used to have a high temper, but now they're not the same anymore. And as they begin to witness the transformation that happens in our lives, then actually change their opinion and say, okay, there is something real about the Christian faith. There is something real about the Christ that they follow. There's something transformational. But it requires us to be authentic before God. It requires us to be authentic towards one another. And it's on that note that um, I'd just like for us to stand so that we can pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time. We thank you that, Lord, we can come and worship you in truth. We can come and worship you and lay our hearts before you. We thank you, Lord, that even though we live in a society where generally society will be opposed to Christianity, as it was when you walked this earth, Christ, I just pray that you may grant us strength, grant us boldness, Grant us, Lord, with courage to be able to live out our Christian faith boldly. May we not shy away from the gospel when we are with our friends. May we not be hypocritical in that sense. But also, Lord, may you help us in the areas where we do have weakness. Help us in the areas, Lord, where our internal heart attitudes are an offense to you. And our internal heart attitudes, Lord Jesus, do not line up with Christ -like, your Christ-like behavior. I pray, Father God, that it, we may continually bring this before you and say, Lord, help us. Help us with our hypocrisy. Help us, Lord, so that we may not be stumbling blocks for those who do not know you. Lord, we come to you and beg that, Lord, please help us in the areas of our lives where we are even blind and do not know that we are sinning. May you shine a light in these areas of our hearts. May you shine a light so, Lord Jesus, in those areas we may have healing. May we, Lord Jesus... Um, sort of entrench ourselves in community so that, Lord, we can even have the confidence to go and talk to a brother or a sister about areas where we are struggling, because it's in that where we have healing. It's in that where um, hypocrisy gets uh, conquered. It, hypocrisy gets wiped away. It's when we come together and are authentic before you, Lord. I pray that this may be the reality in our hearts. And Father God, I also pray for those who may be far away from you, because, Lord, even those those who are not Christians um, may be discouraged or uh, put off Christianity. I pray that, Lord, our lives may shine a light in a way that it draws them to you in Jesus' name. I even pray, Lord Jesus, that our lives may even make those, Lord Jesus, who may claim to be Christians but aren't, um, come back to you, Lord, because your saving grace encapsulates all. It doesn't just encapsulate those who are in the camp. It encapsulates even the hypocrites, even those who you call genuine hypocrites, even those, Father God, you spoke to harshly in, the, in, in, in your word. I pray, Father, you may reach out to them in a special way and that our lives may reach out to them and shine a light in a way that brings them to you. Father, we're just thankful for your grace, your continual grace, that even when it may feel like we're drowning, drowning in our own um, feelings, drowning in our own um, in, in the pit, Father God, I pray that you, with your grace, reach out your hand, reach down, and save us. Father God, we need your salvation every day. We need your salvation to walk this Christian walk. We thank you, Father, in Jesus Christ's mighty name. Amen.